Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to those of you on the West Coast. My name is Nick Malillo. I'm a partner in Baker Hostetler's Real Estate Group and the leader of the New York Real Estate Team. I'm excited for today's webinar on commercial leasing in the COVID-19 era, entitled Commercial Leasing in COVID-19, What to Expect Next. The webinar today will focus on the impact that the pandemic has had on the commercial leasing industry, some key issues that have been highlighted, strategies for success in modifying existing leases, and thoughts for the market going forward, including terms and provisions to consider when entering into new leases. Uh, I started my career almost 15 years ago as a leasing attorney representing some of the nation's largest shopping center owners and operators in hundreds of retail leases. While I've broadened my practice significantly over the years to include real estate finance and development, continue to represent major national retailers and owners in various commercial lease transactions, as well as ground lease transactions, partial, single, and multi-floor office and specialty leases, and lease and license agreements for local and national businesses, large and small, including restaurants, hotels, coffee shops, warehousing and logistics providers, and manufacturers. I'm joined today by several of my colleagues from various offices throughout the firm from New York to California, as well as a special guest from our friends at Cushman and Wakefield who will give some up-to-date market insight on the topics we are discussing. I'll take a minute here to introduce our panelists and give you a little bit of their background. Bruce Green is a partner in our Los Angeles office who's been practicing real estate law for almost 45 years. He has extensive experience representing both landlords and tenants in all aspects of commercial real estate leasing nationwide. Michael Papert is a partner in our Houston office and leads the Houston real estate team. He assists his clients in creating and implementing strategies for their business transactions and has been involved in the acquisition, development, leasing, management, financing, and sale of commercial and residential real estate over his career. His representation is extended to national and multinational financial institutions, real estate companies, insurance concerns, oil and gas companies, and pharmaceutical companies. Michael Wild uh, counsels national, national restaurant and hospitality clients on leasing, sale leasebacks, and franchise issues, in addition to representing clients before various state county, and city boards on land use and development matters. Michael's practice also involves a variety of other business and commercial transactions, including financing transactions, licensing agreements, entity formation and entity restructuring. Michael Iannuzzi is a counsel in our New York office. He focuses his practice on leasing, complex real estate financing, and development deals. He has over 10 years of experience representing landlords and tenants in office and retail leasing. Anna Dix is a senior associate in our Atlanta office. She has experience representing landlords and tenants in a variety of commercial leasing transactions for office, industrial, retail, and student housing space. In addition, she has specialized experience in healthcare real estate, where she manages a leasing portfolio for a multi-system healthcare enterprise. In healthcare, her work includes preparing and negotiating stark and anti-kickback compliant ground leases, space leases, and timeshare agreements. And last but certainly not least, Evan Algier is a senior director in Cushman and Wakefield Midtown Manhattan office, where he specializes in tenant representation services in the New York metropolitan area. Evan advises both the public and private sector on the structuring of real estate solutions that cater to their financial and operational objectives. Evan's clients uh, on a national, local, and international level include financial institutions, law firms, venture capital firms, not-for-profit, technology companies, and others. So as you can see, we have a great panel for you today. It's going to be somewhat of a uh, virtual round table. We're all gonna discuss some of our experience in this area over the last several months. But before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items we'd like to bring to your attention. This presentation will last approximately one hour and is available for one hour of CLE credit in California, New York, Pennsylvania, and Texas, and in New Jersey via reciprocity. Credit is pending in Florida, Georgia, Ohio, Tennessee, and Washington State. For all of the states, credit will be applied for as requested. Please note the following if you're applying for CLE credit. There will be two separate codes that will appear in the slide deck during the program. Please write down these codes at the end of the webinar. Click on the link to take the survey to obtain CLE credit. Again, please be sure to click on the survey link at the end of the webinar and complete the CLE questionnaire. This will pop up after the webinar is over. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can click on the Q&A button and type your questions. We'll try our best to answer them at the end of the program, time permitting, of course. If not, we'll follow up with you after the webinar to answer your questions. In addition, each of the presenter's email addresses will be provided at the end of the webinar, or you can send us questions directly. 
and a recording of the webinar will also be provided to all attendees. <clears throat> now that we've got that out of the way, let's dive into this discussion. The COVID-19 pandemic has been one of the most widespread and disruptive public health emergencies of all time. As the pandemic crept into our nation, cities and states were forced to act swiftly to mitigate the spread of this deadly disease. As we all know, quarantines, closures, and restrictions were universally contemplated and widely implemented in an effort to keep people apart and stop the spread. While these measures have been hotly debated in public and private forums, as we all know, due largely in part to the tremendous macro and microeconomic fallout they caused, they've become a part of life as we know it today. Commercial leasing is a market that was especially impacted by the pandemic and the regulations and restrictions that spawned as a result. The governmental restrictions sent a shock to the system and turned the modern commercial leasing market on its head. Tenants of all sizes in various industries have been forced to either close or significantly alter their operations, which has resulted in paralyzing decreases in revenue, even forcing many to close their doors indefinitely. Tenants were quickly faced with the difficult decision of whether to utilize remaining revenues and reserves to pay their rent or to pay their other expenses and liabilities, such as payroll, debt service, accounts payable, and others. So from the tenant's perspective, they were being deprived of the benefit of their bargain with their landlords. They were being required to pay rent, often substantial amounts, while being prevented from using the space for its intended purposes. From the landlord's perspective, they were not preventing the tenants from operating in their space at all. It was the government. And they too have contractual and financial obligations with their lenders, partners, and taxing authorities that have to be met. So to start us off in the discussion, I think it would be prudent to discuss where we started and what has evolved over the last few months. I, like others on the panel, have been involved in several negotiations from the outset and have seen a number of trends emerging. So uh, I'm going to kick it over to the panel now. Bruce, can you, can you start us off and give us a bit of insight on how you saw the issues raised initially and how those discussions have evolved over the last few months? Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, as, as you've noted on this first slide here, um, initially, and I'm talking about back in April, maybe in March, um, tenants were looking to either defer their rent or to abate their rent, or in some cases to get out of their leases because of the COVID pandemic. And they would approach landlords and they would make these arguments that you've just mentioned. You know, I can't use my space. I've lost the benefit of my bargain. Um, you need to do something. And initially what I saw was landlords were very reluctant to do anything. And for these same reasons that you put up on the screen, it wasn't their fault that this happened. This is really a risk that tenants assume not landlords. Uh, landlords still have to pay their mortgages, their lenders were pressing them, taxes, et cetera, et cetera. And, and of course they claim that the tenants had other, uh, other available ways of dealing with the problem. Uh, if you hear dogs in the background, everybody, I apologize. I tried to get as far away as possible from my dogs, but I hear them downstairs. Anyway, this is where it started. You know, many, many states, most states probably, many cities, counties, they passed eviction moratoria. Some of them dealt with deferring rent, talked about when it was going to be paid back. They were very confusing. They were limited in time. I don't think anybody was able to focus in on them but it gave the tenant a little bit of leverage because they were in some cases able to rely on the statutes uh, that were being passed. So when they would approach the landlords, they would, they would point to those statutes and say, look, you know, we, we are not gonna be evicted by you, so let's, let's make a deal. Right around then, I think what happened is the lawyers started to get involved because arguing equities is fine, but it doesn't necessarily get, you know, get things resolved. So lawyers got involved and we started seeing letters flying back and forth, raising legal arguments as to why uh, rent should be deferred or abated or whatever. And probably the most prevalent, the, the real hot topic I think that most people have seen is force majeure. And we could probably spend the whole webinar talking about force majeure, but I don't want to. I just want to briefly touch on it because it's something that lots of people are talking about. Most of the people uh, that are listening probably know what force majeure is, but just uh, in case, it, it's, it's a provision, it's a contractual provision, which basically sets forth the circumstances under which a party's performance under that contract is either excused or delayed. 
the triggering event there is usually an unforeseeable event and something outside of the control of the parties. So this is something we see in many contracts and in a great many leases. But we also usually see it about on page 99 out of page 100 of the lease. It's not something I think in the past that has been paid much attention to. Uh, it is not, in my experience, something that I have heavily negotiated. Sometimes I have negotiated it when there, is, there are construction obligations. And that's been, I think, the focus of force majeure in the past has been more or less on delays due to uh, bad weather, strikes, labor, things like that. So sometimes that resulted in negotiations, but most of the time we see boilerplate forms. Now we're seeing litigation over force majeure provisions in leases. And in the past, there's been some, there's not a whole lot of precedent. And it is certainly not something that the courts are favoring. And I think the landlords realize this in, their, in the discussions with their tenants. It is not a favored defense because it has drastic results. It could basically allow a tenant not to pay rent when a landlord has all these obligations ongoing it could allow a tenant to completely get out of its lease. What's important though, is that these are state specific provisions. Every state has its own laws. So there's no hard and fast rule about how courts are gonna look at force majeure provisions. Most of them will look to the language of the clause. And that is critical. And it's interesting that because in the past, many lawyers I know have not really negotiated these things. You can look back now and say, gee, maybe I should have done this. Maybe I should have included that. But the first place that the courts are going to look is at the language. And does it include things like pandemics, epidemics? It sometimes Bruce, let me interrupt you for one second. Um, yeah. Can we just advance the slides quickly? I think that, that your last statement brings up a good point in the two types of common or two categories of common arguments, you know, the four corners of the contract, which Bruce is saying that the court is really going to look in the four corners. They're going to take a look at the actual language says, and then there's also common law defenses. So uh, I just wanted to advance the slide and Bruce, you can continue on, on that point if you'd like. Yeah, I'm sort of focusing on the top of this slide now, you know, the four corners of the contract. And again, it's more than just the force majeure clause, but that's, I think that's the one that most people are hearing about and the one that most people would be most interested in. Can rent be abated or uh, at least terminated or deferred due to a force majeure clause in a lease? And as I was saying, A, it's state specific. B, the courts will definitely look to the language and see if these covered events are part of the language that was used. Most, I would venture to say that most force majeure clauses do not mention pandemics or epidemics. Some do, especially uh, I think because of the SARS outbreak a few years back, they started to find their way into uh, force majeure clauses. Most of them don't. Now it's not the death knell, but often what you will see tagged on at the end is things like, uh, well, let, let me get back, let me back up. The, the normal types of things we think about when we think about force majeure, natural disasters, earthquakes, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, things like that. We also think of acts of war and resurrection. We think of things like strikes, labor shortages and things of that nature. Pandemics, like I said, not so much. That could change, however. Uh, just considering the, the global effect of COVID 19 courts may be more lenient in allowing pandemics to be included under some catch-all language like you know where it's say any other cause beyond the control of the parties maybe but perhaps even more significant is the government shutdowns okay those government shutdowns government orders uh, those things are more often than not included in some form or another within force majeure clauses so you've got two grounds to seek to enforce force majeure clauses and tenants are obviously putting forth both of them. Now the big elephant, the, the big elephant in the room, however, is most leases I would venture to say, specifically say that the payment of rent is not excluded. 
is not uh, part of a force majeure event. And that's it. If it says that, the force majeure clause is basically going to be meaningless to the tenant. And landlords know that. Um, that hasn't stopped tenants from bringing it up. It hasn't stopped tenants from suing over those clauses. But I think that ultimately, if you have a, a clause that says rent is not included, it's going to be a loser for the tenant. Now, that doesn't mean that the landlord won't negotiate, but it certainly shifts the balance of the negotiations a little bit in favor of the landlord. But there are other, there are other arguments, which uh, someone will talk about, one of my colleagues will talk about, even if you do not have a force majeure clause, they're on the screen there, frustration and possibility and practicability. Those things all exist. And I think we've gotten to the point where most landlords realize we've got a problem here and it is not going to be easy to replace tenants if they've got a good tenant, a solid tenant, and there's a reasonable likelihood that that tenant will have its business up and running in a reasonable time period, they're going to work a deal. And I have seen most landlords are receptive to some sort of rent deferral, rent abatement, not so much terminations. I'm not seeing that much, but they recognize the realities of the marketplace. So the, the dynamic has shifted tremendously. We are seeing deals made. We can talk about the, later on, I think someone's going to talk about the types of deals. So let me just open the discussion to the panel on force majeure specifically. And if there isn't much to talk about there, uh, we can move on to the other so-called common law defenses. Nick, back to Thanks, you. Thanks, uh, I just want to, to mention, you know, I think that that summed it up really well in that, you know, in the beginning here, you know, no matter what the contract said a lot of times, Tenants were going to tenants were throwing everything against the wall, and you know that's where it started as being very polarized. Because the landlord would say, you know, okay, um, you know, we're not giving you anything. You know, you're subject to the contract, and and the contract says this. But then, as Bruce mentioned, you know, based on the strength of the tenant and the understanding of this that the pan, that the widespread impact of the pandemic was having, the parties started to come together. Um, I do think it would be important to highlight some of these other defenses quickly um, to show what types of, of defenses and other arguments that were made, because these are still coming up today, and they are, to some extent, still the, the, the starting point of these discussions, although, as, as Bruce was mentioning, I do think it goes kind of by the wayside once the parties start talking on more of a rational level and, and really just trying to be collaborative to work out a deal. But before we move on, let's let's talk about a couple of these other uh, defenses and other points quickly, and then we could move on to the next uh, portion of the discussion. Mike Ianuzzi, do you want to jump in and talk a little bit about uh, some of the common law defenses? Thing. Thanks, Nick. So um, along with uh, force majeure and some of the other uh, contractually based defenses, um, two other uh, doctrines are also usually claimed by tenants, uh, these being impossibility or impracticability of performance, as well as frustration of purpose. These are somewhat linked, um, but since I practice in New York, I'm going to talk about the uh, fundamentals of these claims um, as we have them. Just note that each state is different and the case law for each one of these uh, defenses is also slightly different as you go from state to state as the state courts interpret them a little bit differently. Um, one of the things also is that regarding the impossibility uh, defense that we have in New York, some other states also have an impracticability of performance um, defense instead of impossibility, which is a little more lenient um, from the beginning. So I'll start off by differentiating between impossibility and frustration of purpose. They are somewhat linked, but uh, for impossibility, you have to have a contract that cannot be performed because some kind of unanticipated event made performance impossible. Uh, that is a pretty high standard. Um, and then similarly, frustration of purpose, you have a change in circumstances, uh, may not make the performance under the contract, or in this case, a lease impossible, but it will make one party's performance worthless to the other party. And get into that a, a little more, so uh, we'll go into impossibility now. So we have uh, 
the, the first fundamental element of that is that some event happened that made performance impossible. Uh, we have COVID may have made performance very difficult, but saying that it made performance under leases impossible is a, is a very high bar. Um, to have impossibility, especially when, the, have, especially when the performance is the payment of rent, right? Yeah. Yeah. And in, in New York, there is case law that says that a tenant's financial situation or financial difficulty um, does not cause um, the tenant to be able to claim an impossibility defense. It has to be uh, something um, that makes it much, um, it, that's not grounds for impossibility. It would have to be something that the building was destroyed or something like that, which would also be covered under a casualty claim or something. Um, frustration of purpose is something that you would think would be a little more likely to be successfully claimed here because what that says is that the purpose of a tenant is so completely frustrated that without uh, the parties knowing that this would occur, the transaction wouldn't make any sense to both parties. Um, the other elements of this is that the frustrating event cannot be foreseeable and it could not have been guarded against within the contract. That's where this defense gets a little difficult to claim by tenants because uh, throughout history, there have been pandemics in the past. There have been certain acts of God and some force majeure clauses in leases do contain uh, pandemic language. Um, so you could argue that, look, a pandemic is something that could be foreseen and guarded against and you chose not to do it. Uh, so while yeah, I two think I, as you've mentioned, you know, I, a lot of this is rolling through the course now and everything is so fact specific, but I know a lot, you know, some, from some prior case law, you know, the, f the mere fact of having a force majeure clause in a lease, which most leases have in some respect, whether it's fully landlord slanted mutual or what have you, the fact that it's in a lease in many instances will vitiate the uh, frustration defense because it, it shows that these types of situations were contemplated in some manner. Um, so I, I do think that, you know, as the, the case law and all these cases that are being filed kind of gets pushed out, um, these defenses are going to be um, less and less available, I think, to be honest with you. Um, but again, we have to kind of see where, these, where this case law turns out. There's been very few cases that have come out recently on these points, but I, I have a feeling there's going to be many more um, coming down the line. Um, does, does anyone else want to talk about some of the other points here? Uh, you know, some of the other um, provisions in the contract, you know, there's interruption of services, there's quiet enjoyment, people have made the arguments. Uh, I don't think we need to really go into in detail some of these. I know we're going to discuss some of them later on uh, when we talk about, you know, what are people talking about now? Um, so I think what we should do is, is just keep it moving and move on to uh, some successful negotiations and su some successful results that we've seen from various panelists here um, after the, uh, the initial discussions have started and you know, the parties have come together, decided that they wanna continue and figure out a, a mutually acceptable way to move forward. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to the panel. Do, you, do people want to talk about some of the things that they have achieved uh, and how they got there so that we can give some insight to our, to our attendees to uh, assist them in their negotiations if, if these are still ongoing? Uh, Nick, I'll throw out a couple of, uh, couple of thoughts here. Um, I, I've, I've had a uh, retail shopping center developer client uh, that owns a significant number of centers throughout the Texas area. Um, and when this all started early on, um, they, uh, they kind of took a proactive stance uh, in, in order to try to create some goodwill between them and their tenants. Uh, they actually uh, went out and offered uh, three month deferrals uh, on rent for any and all tenants that um, wanted to exercise that option. Uh, 
um, with the agreement that the deferrals would then be um, spread out and amortized over the remainder of the term after the beginning of the first of the year, 2021, uh, and with uh, the agreement that the tenants would also agree to an extension uh, of their lease term. Uh, surprisingly, in most of those situations, it was, uh, uh, they were actually not uh, inundated with tenants who in fact took them up on it, which was a bit of a surprise. But um, um, my client um, did it uh, in order to, uh, one, create goodwill with their tenants, which uh, was important going forward um, after, uh, after things started to return to normal. And um, at the same time, uh, afforded their tenants an opportunity to um, get some relief, uh, try to get their feet back underneath them, and um, hopefully avoid a situation where uh, tenants would just close up shop and walk away. So um, um, we, uh, we did uh, do that. We did it very early on in the, the process. We, we reached out to them beginning in April. And uh, like I said, surprisingly, it was not um, taken up. I'm, on the other hand, um, uh, my, um, my office um, clients, my office um, owner clients uh, have taken a bit of a much more hardline uh, stance on it. Uh, they were um, basically not willing to engage in any sort of negotiations uh, regarding uh, rent deferrals, rent abatements, any sort of deals, uh, and, and basically said, uh, 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 you know, uh, you've got PPP money coming. Uh, you need to make uh, you need to make efforts in order to go out and get uh, those PPP loans. Uh, so that you can continue to uh, pay us our rent uh, and said, you know, uh, you can come back to us at a later time if, uh, if this thing persists. So um, I think uh, all in all, it was uh, from their perspective, it was a, um, you know, but we'll, 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 we'll look at it at a later point in time. It, it, we don't know if this is short term. We don't know if it's long term uh, and didn't uh, just kind of uh, jump um, uh, at, uh, at the needs um, uh, or perceived needs of the tenants and uh, the tenants trying to take opportunities at that time. Yeah, you know, I, I think most of the successful modifications that I've been involved in have been achieved when both sides recognize their considerations, those considerations that we talked to talked about up front, you know, on the tenant side that, that they're really not being uh, given the benefit of their bargain and on the landlord side that they also have obligations to pay. When tenants and landlords come together to discuss with those considerations in mind, you know, I've found that the, the, the discussions go much more smoothly. And what, what I've seen personally, and I'm not going to go into too much because I'll, I'll let the panelists speak, but some giving, giving the tenants some sort of a break, some, some sort of mechanism to alleviate the pain during the time that they're closed down. But on the back end, also understanding that the landlord has these other obligations and they're going to have to recoup that money in some form, whether wholly or partially, in, in some form down the line, whether it's through a deferral of rent or um, the ability to apply other monies and, and things along those lines. So that's where I've been seeing most of the success is when both parties come together understanding the hardships that and uh, hardships and obligations that the other party may have. Nick, I agree, anyone with, else? Nick, I agree with that too. And one of the successes that I had was dealing with a tenant that was had space for uh, purposes related to the theater industry in Manhattan. And as most people on the call probably know, um, Broadway and the theater um, industry in Manhattan has probably been the most hardest hit, if not one of the hardest hit industries, because they are essentially shut down until I think it's January 1st at this point, and it can po possibly be completely shut down until after that. And the landlord and tenant got together and looked at economically how harmed the tenant is from this, and they figured out, okay, well, you have a long-term lease. We'd like you to stay after the lease. Eventually, this is going to go away. And they figured out, okay, well, how much can you pay during the term of the lease? 
and they did uh, deferrals and reductions in rent up front and then backloaded the rental payments a little more toward the end of the term and did a modification that way. Uh, there was no threatened litigation by either party. Uh, they just sat down, sharpened their pencils and, and figured that out. And hopefully you'll get the tenant through um, a really tough time where they're basically completely shut down with no revenue for a nine month period, if not a little bit longer. I've seen a lot of that as well, Mike, you know, where, you know, for the deferral period, they'll defer the rent for whatever, six months. And then at some point in time later on, whatever that lump deferred rent was, I've seen them amortize that over the remainder of the of the term or over a period of years so that, you know, the landlord, as I mentioned before, is, is recouping some of the some or all of, of the benefit that they gave the tenant which kind of gives that in both sides an incentive to find a mutually uh, acceptable way to move forward. Um, you know, just to touch on some of these other things on the slide before we move on, um, you know, as uh, Mr. Papert was saying before, you know, some landlords were gonna defer rent and ask for term extensions. That way they, you know, you defer the rent, but then you get a, a little bit more rent on the back end that, they, that may be uncertain given the, given the market. Some tenants have agreed to surrender some of their space. Some landlords have accepted it, given the market with their you know, anticipation of filling those spaces at higher rents. Maybe these leases were entered into a while ago. Um, again, this certainly depends on the market of where you are and, and what type of product uh, we're talking about here. But um, I've seen that as well. And, and also application of, of money is owed. You know, for example, tenant improvement allowances that may be owed by the landlord. They'll say, all right, you know, we owe you this money. Uh, you may not have met all the um, requirements to get the money yet. You have this amount of time to do it, but in the meantime, we'll start applying that tenant improvement allowance against you, uh, uh, as credits against your rent. We've seen that as well. Um, so there's a number of different ways that landlords and tenants have uh, successfully modified their leases, keeping in, in mind the uh, interest on both sides. And I, I think that's a, a, a common factor in, in any successful negotiation there. Nick, can you um, hear me? Bruce, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. I think we go started ahead. off, I think we one of us cut the other off at, at the outset. I'm having the same experiences out here in California and, and nationally. You know, the deferrals, the uh, amortizations, I found that most landlords have been amenable to this. The problem now is that most of those deferrals went on, you know, they agreed to three months, four months, five months, and now we're six, almost seven months into this. And those deferrals are running out. And now the tenants are gonna to have to go back to the landlord and ask again. And it's gonna be a lot harder the second time around. Um, but the landlords probably are not gonna sit without any rent for a whole lot longer. Some of these deferral agreements specifically require that the tenant waives these defenses going forward. So it's gonna put them into a, a, a worse bargaining position so what was in April and, and May and, or March and April may not be what's gonna happen now in, in October. I think, I, I think that's a great point, Bruce. Just, just, uh, just make note that obviously uh, the, the effect and the successful modifications and the, neg the nature of negotiations uh, obviously depends upon the type of product that we're talking about. I, I, I've seen a lot of what we're talking about and what y'all are talking about in the, uh, in the retail shopping uh, center um, types of negotiations. Uh, haven't seen that in the industrial area. Uh, I have not seen and I've not experienced that nationwide with uh, my clients necessarily in the office market. Um, so uh, again, part of it and, and in fact, most of it is, is uh, dependent upon the, the, the product type. Yeah, and the one thing I would actually add to this as far as the methods for the modifications is we've successfully negotiated ten with tenants and landlords in drawing down on security deposits. And obviously there's different financial impacts if the security is held in cash versus letters of credit. Um, but basically they've drawn down on the security and agreed to a mutually agreeable outside date to replenish that deposit at a later period in time when the tenant has more visibility into their revenue stream. I've seen that as well, Evan. Yeah. I don't. Okay. I don't, I don't mean to. I don't mean to jump. Sorry, go jump ahead. 
I don't I don't mean to uh, to jump a topic and uh, you can you can slap me down if you want, but um, uh, I obviously a lot of this is also driven uh, and what our uh, landlords and our tenants uh, have been able to do is in fact been driven by lenders. Um, so, um, um, and, and that may be, uh, I think that's a topic yeah, that you plan on bringing Yeah, I think up. we're gonna, that's, that's, no, that, that's a good that's segue into our, next, into our next topic, Mike. Um, you know, now that we've got a better idea of you know, where we've started and how we've got to where we are today, I, I think it's good at this point to discuss some of the hot topics and lease negotiations. And in connection with that, the lender considerations as well. So let's advance to the next slide. I know we've spoken a little bit about force majeure. We could talk a little bit more about that now, um, but I'd like to turn it over to the panel to discuss some of the, you know, the hot topic provisions that people are talking about and really focusing on in current lease negotiations. Well, let me say this, uh, Nick, on the force majeure provisions, clearly we're all paying more attention to them now. And clearly, now that we know that COVID is a problem, pandemics, epidemics, we're trying to, at, at a minimum, include those as triggering events. The problem I'm finding, though, is that getting over that hurdle that's been out there, you know, the concept for so many years that rent is not excused because of a force majeure event has been very difficult. And I'm not seeing a whole lot of movement on landlords' part in changing that. But again, it all depends, as, as most, most things do, it depends on the strength, the bargaining strength of the tenant and the bargaining strength of the landlord. There's gonna be a lot of empty retail space out there, a lot of empty office space. <clears throat> I think a tenant's gonna have an easier time getting some favorable provisions in those types of buildings where landlords don't have a whole lot of choice in other properties not so much industrial is going to be very hard to to get force majeure provisions that cover rent and covid and what have you that's just my thought i haven't we haven't had enough experience with this yet to know for sure but that's where i see this going yeah i think this is all i think it's all progressing and you know i've, I've had some conversations and current lease negotiations on force majeure and the effect on rent and the conversations have yet to be settled, so I can't say I've been successful yet. But a lot of times, um, either if I'm representing a landlord or a tenant, what the, um, the argument is, is let's talk about this now, right? The tenants want to talk about it now. They want to say, if there's a force majeure and we're shut down, what's going to happen to my rent, right? Let's put in place these other types of modifications, modification thought, thought theories that we just talked about. Let's put it in writing now. So that when it does occur, we don't have to go back. We don't have to, to argue. And the landlord is saying, no, 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 I don't want to do that. You know, force majeure always carves out rent. And we'll see when the time comes. I don't know what my financial position is going to be like then. I don't know what it's going to look like. So th that's the discussion that's going on now with regard to force majeure and a carving out rent. I think it's still really a very open topic. And people are being very creative with it. But I agree with you, Bruce. It hasn't been settled and it's still to be flushed out. But let's talk about some of these other, you know, other points very briefly. I know we're starting to run a little bit low on time. I'd like to get through the rest of the slides. Um, does anyone want to talk about some of these other points? Um, and maybe we could bring back in uh, Mr. Papert's point on the lender considerations as well. Sure. Um, uh, obviously, I guess the direction I was headed was that um, lenders, uh, obviously the, the, the landlords are in situations uh, uh, just as the tenant is. Uh, landlords are, are uh, operating obviously on a rental stream uh, and their ability to take care of debt service does in fact depend upon uh, the continued uh, rental stream from their tenants. Um, um, we, uh, we have um, engaged in and have for some time trying to uh, engage our lenders uh, in uh, discussing um, deferrals uh, uh, of, uh, of debt service. Um, it, uh, it has uh, generally, it has been unsuccessful. Uh, most of the lenders uh, that we have um, been engaged with have uh, either uh, ignored us 
um, um, uh, uh, to a great extent uh, or told us uh, to uh, come back at a later point in time that uh, rents were still being paid by the office tenants. Um, I, um, you know, there was still a high payment rate from office tenants. So um, they were, uh, they, they knew that we still had uh, funds coming in and able to take care of debt service. Um, others have in fact uh, worked with us uh, and um, allowed us just to take care of interest only payments for a period of time for the, re the remainder of this year. Um, so that um, we're, our, our out-of-pockets are, are a bit limited. Uh, and then others, in fact, um, have uh, allowed us to utilize um, reserves that we have um, on, uh, um, in escrow with the lenders. Uh, they, they're working with us to allow us to use some of those reserves uh, in order to take care of cash flow and um, uh, take care of debt service uh, needs. Yeah, I mean, from, from my perspective, from my perspective, I see a lot of, you know, landlords and tenants being very creative. And just on this lender point, you know, the land landlords and, and tenants being creative and coming up with these um, agreements and, and points and leases, you always have to then consider the, the lender's underwriting position. So as cre the more and more creative that landlords and tenants get, the more and more scrutiny the lenders are going to be giving to these leases because it, it's, it's their income stream as well. So that's something that both tenants and landlords need to keep in mind when they're trying to formulate these um, types of provisions to protect both sides going forward. Um, you need to contemplate the lender and it's, in my opinion, best practice to involve the lender uh, as soon as you guys are getting closer to some sort of an agreement on one of these specialized points. And, the, and the, 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 depending upon who the lender is or the type of the lender is, you uh, obviously you're getting different kinds of results um, in the CMBS uh, market um, uh, that is next to impossible. The special services uh, basically are inundated and uh, overwhelmed with all the requests and all uh, we've had uh, a, 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 even the master servicer, we have been unable to get uh, responsiveness from them to try to work with us. And in some cases, uh, uh, clients in fact have intentionally put loans into default in order to get to the special servicer and try to get some additional attention. Um, um, and, and additionally, we've, we've kind of taken a position um, uh, instead of having to go back and ask land lenders for permission to give deferrals, which uh, most most loans uh, would require any sorts of changes and modifications. Um, you have to go back to the lender and ask for permission to do so. Uh, the fact that they're not being responsive, um, we've, we've advised uh, clients to basically take the position to go ahead and do what they need to do in order to protect their asset uh, and do what they need to do in order to protect the collateral for the lender. Uh, and if that means that you've got to give some deferrals, uh, um, uh, that's great, but stay away from abatements, but uh, deferrals just don't see that um, a uh, lender attempting to put somebody into default and foreclose uh, based upon a uh, landlord or building owner's attempts to continue to manage and <coughs> operate their property and, and keep it as a uh, going concern that uh, it's going to be very successful if you try to go into court, tell a judge that uh, you're foreclosing because they gave deferrals on, on rents or restructured uh, leases uh, without major modifications. Yeah, and, and I, agree, I agree with that. Obviously, termination rights go pretty far and are something that lenders are very sensitive to unless there's a, uh, you know, substantial payment and notice period as well. Sorry, yeah, I Mike, cut somebody off. Yeah, it was me, uh, Nick. I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Mike just said. Um, by the way, terminations are never going to fly with lenders, so I, I don't okay. see that ever happening. But I, I, I think, you know, the adage of doing it and then asking for forgiveness later yeah. may well be the rule of thumb here because uh, I, I also can't see courts allowing uh, lenders to foreclose when reasonable accommodations are made to a tenant in the midst of the pandemic. Um, I'd rather take that chance than lose the tenant over, yeah. uh, over these arguments that can possibly be avoided with some reasonable accommodations. So that's what I'm seeing too. All right, well, let, let's move on. I think the next slide is our first um, 
and it's coming a little bit late in the webinar, but this is our first CLE code. Please uh, write this down and, and keep it for the end of the webinar. I know a number of the questions came in and said, where's the CLE code? So here it is. Um, take a moment, write it down, and we'll move on. Um, so while some of this next topic has already been touched upon earlier in the discussion, I wanted to turn now to some you know, specific market perspectives that are unique to various commercial leasing industries. Um, I'd like to start with Anna and the healthcare and student housing. Um, Anna, you know, as someone who's deeply involved in, in healthcare and student housing leasing, can you kick us off with some unique issues presented in this field? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I think in general, um, in addition to, you know, the general commercial concerns that we've discussed already on this call, in the healthcare space, the pandemic has brought about an additional layer of challenges largely because transactions between healthcare providers and physicians, including uh, the immediate family members of physicians, are federally regulated under the Stark Law and the anti-kickback statute. So these regulations are designed to ensure that deals are fair market and they're designed to prevent uh, physicians and healthcare entities from providing sweetheart deals in exchange for referrals or other business benefits. So as COVID hit, obviously doctors were asking um, or tenants were asking their landlords for some flexibility with respect to rent and payments due under their leases. And thankfully, CMS announced some temporary waivers to the Stark Law to relax some of the compliance requirements that make it difficult to modify leases. Um, and basically, absent fraud or abuse, the waivers under Stark have allowed for temporary arrangements in leasing. Uh, that's below fair market value, and also for remuneration from entities to physicians or vice versa uh, that result from loans with either interest rates that are below fair market value or loans that are on terms uh, that would not otherwise be available from a uninterested commercial lender. So I think in healthcare, while overall it's positive that some of the regulatory scheme has been relaxed, um, the challenge operationally that we're encountering is there's little guidance on how far landlords and tenants can go on these types of accommodations without um, posing a stark or anti-kickback violation. So um, at this point, a lot of the trends that we're seeing are similar to other markets. Um, for example, in medical office space where um, the practices were either shut down because of state and local requirements uh, for COVID, or if it was a practice that did a lot of um, discretionary medical procedures um, that largely halted in the height of COVID. Um, we've seen some deferrals for all or part of rent um, together with an agreement to repay that rent over a set period of time. Um, other things we've seen is uh, modifications to leasing arrangements where you would see abatement on the front end in exchange for increasing the length of the term. Um, on the back end. And typically you see about a month of abatement per year of extension. And then um, you're seeing some other more deal specific things. For example, if um, leases had TI dollars, sometimes converting those to free rent, or if leases provided for abatement throughout the term of the lease, perhaps front loading that while the practices were closed or ramping back up in their business operations. Um, we've also seen some other specialized types of arrangements for industries um, within the medical field that are harder hit. Um, so for example, um, practices that are able to reopen but have seen kind of a slow increase in, um, in their patient volume, we've seen ramping up payments. So perhaps going from not paying anything to paying half rent for a few months and then uh, back, to full run a few uh, back to full rent a few months later. Um, of course, with the appropriate modifications to make sure that money ultimately is repaid. Um, so there's really, there's a variety of things. I think overall, from a practical perspective, if you're dealing with a client that, um, you know, falls under the purview of Stark and Anti-Kickback, we've been really advising people to just paper their files to make sure that if they're ever audited on any of these types of accommodations, they can back up why uh, the decisions that they made were reasonable. So um, things that we're asking people to include would um, be like the time periods that practices were closed, if they have financial information showing how much a particular type of practice or um, revenue was impacted. Um, and then also if there's a specific line of business that is impacted um, 
on a broader scale than just like a general medical practice. So for example, um, we've done some work recently with a elite sports performance training facility and they're really seeing much lower volume because parents aren't comfortable sending, you know, their, their five-star recruits into a crowded workout space. Um, things like that, documenting uh, specific industry concerns. Then, um, Thanks, Dan. I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I, know, I know we're running a little bit low on time, uh, and I'd really like to get to uh, Evan on the uh, current market status, but let's take maybe a minute, Mike Inuzi, and just talk about, um, you know, office and some of the things that, some of the considerations in office leasing that people are bringing up in lease negotiations now. Sure thing, Nick. I'll jump through these pretty quickly. Uh, the first major item is base flexibility and you're seeing uh, asks for this take a couple of different shapes and forms the first is uh, tenants want broader subleasing or assignment rights so that if they need to make adjustments they can go that route um, also what they're asking for are various uh, options for more space or an option to downsize space those are also ways you can do it and then if all else fails uh, in order to get flexibility they can opt for a shorter uh, term rather than the normal uh, 10 year office lease or seven year office piece, um, office lease. Also what you're seeing are tenants are looking at the services that they're provided under their leases. Uh, so one thing that's went to the forefront recently is cleaning and decontamination. Uh, also what a lot of tenants uh, are looking at too is making sure the lease has some language in there saying that um, the HVAC systems in the buildings are at are healthy that um, there's certain um, fresh air is being brought into the building, air filters are changed within a reasonable time, uh, maybe that there's UV light filters retrofitted into the HVAC system to kill any um, bacteria or viruses. Uh, also, they want to make sure that the elevators are clean, sanitary, large enough to comply with social distancing guidelines, things like that. And in some uh, buildings, they also want checkpoints to make sure that other people that they're sharing the building with, which is a larger building, uh, aren't coming in sick. So that's uh, a couple of things that will now have to be looked at in the future for uh, new office leases. Thanks, Mike. And you know, again, I, I'd like to get into the market update for the last uh, five or six minutes we have here. Um, retail, obviously, you know, continuous use, co-tenancy, force majeure, all the things that we've talked about. Uh, we're largely um, in the retail sector. But now I'll turn it over for the last uh, five or six minutes that we have to Evan Algier uh, from Cushman and Wakefield to give us a little bit of a discussion on uh, current market condition. Sure, and thank you, Nick, and the Baker Settler team for having me. So if you're anything like me, folks, you're probably uh, exhausted to the point of working from home and at least having that discussion about how's the experience been. But I think it's absolutely relevant in today's age, uh, today's age, you know, not just because we're all doing it, but because of the impact that it's going to have on the markets moving forward. So general occupancy trends and square footage per employee or per attorney in this case are shifting along with the view of how we utilize space and the shifting perspective of the workday or the absence of the nine to five. You know, and there's obviously pros and cons to a lot of this. There's more time with family, the lack of commute, the more balanced lifestyle in some cases, and the cons, you know, questions around productivity, which is constantly being evaluated, ability to climb the corporate ladder, mentoring and leadership, which I know is incredibly important in the legal sector, um, and then innovation. You know, all of these points are weighing in on the decisions of companies to come back to uh, the office and how they utilize space. So the relevance it has had is that it's created a vital difference between this recession and previous ones like 2001, 2008, 2009. So people aren't sure when they're coming back. So this is therefore creating a scenario where leases are naturally expiring and people aren't taking new office space to roll into immediately thereafter. So it's created a drastic difference between the supply and demand side. You know, I've even spoken to some law firms who are discussing with partners that in order to keep their office, they have to commit to a minimum of three to four days per week. Otherwise, they'll be assigned a seat, right? And all of this ties back into the general uh, work uh, space planning of firms, the absorption in the marketplace, and is a good segue into the leasing activity side of yesterday versus today. So the commercial real estate markets have effectively been frozen uh, with limited exceptions over the last six to seven months. To put things in perspective, our 2019 monthly leasing average 
specific to New York was about 3.5 million square feet. Whereas we barely scratched the 1 million square foot mark per month, much of that being renewals for companies to maintain a consistency in their existing office until there's more visibility in the market moving forward and when or whether or not there's going to be impacts from uh, the election, from vaccine, from what the timing is on the vaccine, uh, as well as other factors like stimulus. So one, one interesting fact it's, is Q2 2020 new leasing activity was the lowest quarterly level in more than 25 years with 2.5 million square feet. Total monthly leasing activity down almost 60% since COVID began in March. You know, and all of this goes into the general deals that are being structured today. And as I mentioned, activity has been sparse. You know, the majority of transactions being done are those that were uh, in the process and being negotiated well before COVID came into the picture. It's no secret the economy and the associated fundamentals have changed the outlook for both tenants and landlords uh, and how they structure these deals. So from what I've personally done, as well as what Cushman and Wakefield has gathered in data, uh, we've seen lease comps in the market for pre versus post COVID economic improvements on deals anywhere from two to 12% on an improved net effective basis. And this is in a variety of factors taken into consideration. There's the length of term, credit worthiness of the tenant, timing. Generally speaking, as we talked about in some of the um, financing aspects earlier, Landlords are most sensitive about face rents. It affects the value of the asset. It affects their next deal. It affects the refinancing. So most of those improvements on a net effective basis that I mentioned have been in the form of uh, tenant improvement allowance, additional free rent, maybe something creative uh, later on, uh, that which is you know, fair market value resets after a certain period of time or reviews. Um, so just given the time, I'll move last to the market forecast. I would say uh, it's going to it's in the next 12 to 15 months, we expect the market to bottom out. You know, there's generally a two to three quarter lag on pricing dropping. Um, so it's going to be a very good time to be a tenant, uh, especially if you can time out your strategy for leverage creation in the course of the next you know, 18 months. And that I would say just being conscious of timing is uh, is our outlook. Evan, I really appreciate that, and sorry I didn't have uh, more time for you there. Uh, time got away from us a little bit here. Uh, but as we're running up to the end of the webinar, uh, I just wanted to thank the panelists, thank all our attendees for joining us today. Uh, as we previously mentioned, the recording of the webinar is going to be sent to all attendees. Um, this next note is important. If you're applying for CLE credit, you know, to obtain the, the credit, you need to click on the link and take the survey after leaving the webinar. Please make sure to answer all the questions. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope you found the presentation helpful. Thanks again.